Hello everybody and welcome to this video where I'm going to analyse the poem Eden Rock by Charles Causley. As always we begin by looking at the poet, looking for details about the poet's life that help us to understand the poem. And as this poem is about Charles Causley himself and his relationship with his parents, then we need to know quite a bit about his family. So let's jump right in. So, Causley was born in 1917 and died in 2003. His father died when Charles was just seven years old, and Charles himself never married. He was a primary school teacher, and he nursed his mother for six years when she was ill before she died in 1971. And the poem Eden Rock was published in 1988 when Charles himself was 61. All of those ages and dates I want you to think about uh, because I think they help us to understand the poem. The poem comes from the collection A Field of Vision, which is a collection of poetry that contains lots of biblical imagery. Now let's have a look at the poem. Like so many in the cluster, it's quite simple to begin with, but it gets more and more complex as we go through. So I will read through it and give you a simple line-by-line -line translation, and then we'll get into the analysis. Now, this is one of those poems where there's not really any obvious answer to some of the questions it brings up, but for us that doesn't matter, and I'll talk to you about why in a second. They are waiting for me somewhere beyond Eden Rock. My father, 25, in the same suit of genuine Irish tweed, his terrier Jack, still two years old and trembling at his feet. So, the poet is speaking about his own parents here. He's saying that they're waiting for him somewhere past Eden Rock. His father, at the age of 25, wearing the same suit as always, the Irish tweed suit, and his dog Jack, who's still two years old, sat shaking at his feet. My mother, twenty-three, in a sprigged dress, drawn at the waist, ribbon in her straw hat, has spread the stiff white cloth over the grass. Her hair, the colour of wheat, takes on the light. So in stanza two, he's saying, My mother, from the age, at the age of twenty-three, is wearing a flower-patterned dress, tied in at the waist. She's got a straw hat that has a ribbon in it, and she spread the picnic cloth over the grass. Her hair is yellow, shining in the light. She pours tea from a thermos, the milk straight from the an old HP sauce bottle, a screw of paper for a cork, slowly sets out the same three plates, the tin cups painted blue. So the mother, she's pouring a cup of tea from a flask, and the milk is in an old ketchup bottle, and rather than having a lid you can tie on, it's actually got some screwed up paper shoved down the neck of the bottle to work uh, as a sort of cork and she lays out the three plates and the tin cups as always. The sky whitens as if lit by three suns. My mother shades her eyes and looks my way over the drifted stream. My father spins a stone along the water, leisurely. So the sky turns so white it's like there are three suns. My mother covers her eyes and looks towards me over the stream, and my father throws a stone, a sort of skimmer stone, across the water. They beckon to me from the other bank. I hear them call, see where the stream path is, crossing's not as hard as you might think. I had not thought that it would be like this. So here's a lot of the ambiguity in the poem, but on the literal level it's saying, well my parents on the other side of the stream, they call to me saying, come across, the, the path isn't hard to cross, and I had not thought it would be like this. So what's happening in this poem? The narrator is imagining his parents, both young again, on the bank of a stream preparing a picnic. The mother's preparing the picnic, the dad's throwing stones into the water, and it's a beautiful, idyllic, peaceful scene. And the narrator is on the opposite side of the stream. His parents try to call him over to them to cross the river. Now, in terms of the love and relationships cluster, this poem is a little bit like Letters from Yorkshire in that there's some ambiguity. There are some questions that we just do not know the answer to. What is actually taking place in this poem? Two lines of thought that are um, explored by most people. Is the poet, or is the speaker, the poet, we know it's the same person, we know Causley has said this is about him and his parents. Is he thinking back to a childhood memory of a day out for a picnic with his parents? Or is there a more symbolic meaning of his parents beckoning him to join them in the afterlife, in heaven? 
It was certainly written at a time when the poet's parents had long since passed away and the poet himself was getting older. He was 61 when the poem was published. But the beauty of this poem is that for the purposes of our analysis in terms of a love and relationships poem, it doesn't matter. You see, it's tempting to look at the clues like the somewhere beyond, where's that, what about the three moons, but all of this would mislead us and what matters most is the fact that the speaker has a very loving, peaceful relationship with his parents, a very secure and delightful relationship with his parents and it's a parent-child relationship poem where the relationship is almost entirely positive except for some of the ending of the poem which we'll look at uh, in this video. It makes a nice comparison to other poems about parent-child relationships, Mother Any Distance, Before You Were Mine, Walking Away, Follower, but I think this is probably the most positive poem in terms of parent-child relationships. So let's have a look at the poet's use of structure. A couple of things that I want to talk about. On the whole, the poem is very organised. It has a very stable structure right up until the end, which we'll talk about separately. So except for the final four lines, each stanza is written in quatrains. That's uh, verses of four lines in length. And most of the lines have the same amount of syllables. Most of them have ten syllables per line. A few of them don't. You can see I've done the syllable count down the left-hand side here. Uh, you might want to, in class, have a look at the lines which don't have ten syllables and think about if that seems significant in any way. But the very tight and controlled structure creates a steady, peaceful tone, which I think reflects how the speaker feels about his parents. They bring him peace, they bring him a sense of security and stability, and they have a very strong, steady relationship. What I like most about this poem is the use of rhyme. When you first look at it, you might think, well, it doesn't rhyme at all. But actually, there's some really clever rhyme taking place, and it's all to do with half rhyme. Now, half rhyme, as you remember from my other videos, is where there's a partial rhyme between two words, but not a complete rhyme. It might be that the vowels rhyme, but the consonants at the end of the words don't, or it might be the other way round. And you might not notice it at first, but there is a very steady rhyme scheme of half rhyme throughout the poem. You can see on the screen here, in every stanza, there's a half rhyme between lines one and three and two and four. So rock and jack. The syllable at the end, the consonant sound, the k, that rhymes. But the vowel sound, the o and the a, do not rhyme. Dress and grass, the s, consonant sounds rhyme, but the vowel sound is e. Eh, and a, ah. straight and out. The t sounds rhyme, but the a and the ow sounds don't. And we see it in the second and fourth line, suit and feet. It's the t, t that rhymes, but not the u or the e. Hat and light, and on it goes all the way through the entire poem. So it's actually a very, very deliberate choice of half rhyme throughout the poem. Now I've talked about half rhyme a lot in my videos, and if you haven't watched the other poem analyses, do so in the playlist. Why do poets use half rhyme? Well, half rhyme suggests that something is lacking. It's not full. It's not full rhyme. It's not complete, which reflects that something's not quite perfect in the relationship. And here we see by the end that the speaker isn't actually with his parents, either literally, in which case we would think of them being divided by a stream, or metaphorically where we might think of them being divided by death. So even though the parent-child relationship is so stable and steady, represented through the very um, steady stanza length and... Um, the very steady use of syllables per line, actually there's a little bit of instability in the half rhyme which suggests that things are a little bit lacking and that is of course the fact that he's not with his parents. And then the final four lines of the poem, they cover the moment where the parents are beckoning, calling the speaker, the narrator, over to their side of the stream. They beckon to me from the other bank. I hear them call. See, see where the stream path is. Crossing is not as hard as you might think. I had not thought that it would be like this. The perfect structure then of the quatrain is broken here. Why? Well, again, we can look at it in terms of a very simple understanding of this being a poem about a boy on the other side of the stream. And we can say, well, the gap between the speaker and his parents is symbolised by the gap between the th uh, third and fourth line. But if we see the poem as a message about the afterlife, the gap between the speaker and his parents is life itself.
So the half rhyme, which is not quite perfect or full, and the disjointed structure of the final four lines symbolises how the relationship with his parents is not quite perfect because they're not together. The final line, as you see it on screen, is isolated from the others, and that is how the speaker feels. And I think this is a poet who is thinking about how much he loved his parents and how steady and how stable they were and how peaceful and all of those things are reflected through most of the choices but is then reflecting on the fact that he's not with them. Very, very clever use of structure. Now, in terms of language, I just want to talk about the fact that there are lots of visuals in the poem. Here's the Irish tweed suit, for example. But I'm not interested in the very simple, easy to understand visual images. So I'm not going to analyse about an HP sauce bottle or tin cups or that kind of thing. These images are very visual and nostalgic. And maybe the attention to such minor details reflects how much he loves his parents. He remembers everything about them. But there's not a lot of sophisticated analysis that can go on with those images. Uh, you might be able to tell me a, a metaphor for the HP sauce bottle. But I think they're just describing in very vivid visual terms exactly what he can remember to show how important his parents were to him. But I want to take it beyond that and I think there are some more sophisticated images to explore so let's take a look at some of those. The first of course is the biblical imagery. Now the poem is called Eden Rock and that is the name of a place but it isn't actually a real place. In fact this is a quote from the poet. Somebody asked me the other day where Eden Rock is I mean, I have no idea. I made it up. Dartmoor, I said. That's always a safe answer. Now, as I record this video, I am sat in my house on Dartmoor, so I was delighted to see that quotation. But if we know this isn't a real place, then it's twice as important. We can look at letters from Yorkshire, for example, and we can say, well, that's called letters from Yorkshire because it's about letters that are from somebody in Yorkshire, we imagine. But when we've got something called Eden Rock as a place, which is the title of the poem and it's mentioned in the first line as the setting, and we know then that it's a fictional setting, we need to analyse why has the poet chosen to call it that. We know it's not a real place, so what's it all about? Why Eden? Well, this goes to biblical imagery. If you know your Bible, in the book of Genesis, God creates the world and he puts Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And it's this beautiful paradise garden in which God walks with Adam and Eve and they have control of the animals. It's just basically an image of paradise and um, uh, sort of essentially heaven. Now, we're a very heavenly place, similar to uh, what the Bible says about when God comes back to the world, he will recreate the sort of perfect world that he created at the beginning. So clearly the intertextual reference used to the biblical book of Genesis here is used as a symbol of the perfection of the parent-child relationship. I believe Causley absolutely idolised his mum and dad and all of the imagery he uses to describe them presents this amazing sort of uh, surreal, beautiful, angelic, heavenly vision of them. Now you could say well all the images of heaven in the Bible are because you know they're up in heaven and it's about dying but again that draws us away from the relationship analysis and gets us into just writing the plot and, and writing about the plot of the poem and we never want to do that okay so we always want to find things and bring them back to love and relationships. Now what else have we got? There's some angelic description of the mother isn't there? Uh, you see the bit where um, she has the hair, the colour of wheat uh, taking on the light and this is uh, an idea of her, her hair being yellow but the, the light shining through it creates an almost angelic image like a halo almost that she's got of uh, this kind of angelic image and there's also color imagery with the pick uh, with the white cloth for the um, uh, the picnic now white is a color that has a symbolism of purity and goodness and references to light and the colour white might suggest a heavenly setting. So if we ignore that that might tell us this is a life after death poem, we can at least say what it tells us about the relationship between mother and son is that it is perfect, it's divine. So there's lots of positive imagery, often biblical or related to notions of angels and purity, which reflects the amazing parent-child relationship. And then there are lots of images related to nature. Now, we see this in a lot of the love and relationships poems. So what do we have here? Rock, straw, grass, wheat, light, sky, sun, stream, stone, bank, as in riverbank, not a bank where you get your money. And this 
plethora, this overwhelming use of natural, beautiful imagery reflects the natural and beautiful love between the parents and their son, Charles Causley. So what about the final line then? There's a lot of ambiguity in the final line. I had not, not thought that it would be like this. It could mean anything really. And again, we're not here to just try and work out what the line means. We're looking at the poet's use of language and structure. So what about the sentence structures here? Well, it's made up of monosyllabic words, words with one syllable in them. I had not thought that it would be like this. And what that does is it creates a sort of childlike simplicity. Now, if we think about the fact that Causley wrote this in the last third of his life, the poet's deliberate use of childish language, we could say, reflects his desire to be close to his parents again, like when he was a child. We know that whether this is about the afterlife or an actual memory, we know that he wasn't with his parents um, for very long, both of them together, because his dad died when he was so young. So the use of childlike monosyllabic language reflects the way that he wants to go back to that childlike state. And this line at the end being isolated on its own again shows the poet isolated on his own. He didn't marry, his mum and dad both gone, and he's missing them. He's missing the parents who he had such a close personal relationship with. I hope you found this video useful. Please do subscribe to the channel.